it's a pleasure to be back with all of you this week, and I, I want to thank all of you for uh, giving me the opportunity to take a, a weekend off. I uh, haven't spent a lot of time with weekends off in the last few years. I've generally worked jobs and been involved in industry, and, and you rarely find yourself with a free weekend. And so I, I do want to thank all of you that, that jumped in and helped. Uh, Corey that, that preached, as well as for all of you giving me the ability to do that. That was a blessing. I spent the weekend with a close friend of mine, but I don't see that often because he lives in the Midwest now, St. Louis. And it was really a restful weekend, and I appreciate that from all of you. As you know, we've been going through the Gospel of John. This is our last week in John. The reason being that when we started the Easter season, we began with the Last Supper and we worked our way through the crucifixion and the resurrection. And then we went back to one and we went all the way through. And now we're, we've arrived at essentially the last part of what Jesus says before he goes to the cross. And so we'll be moving on from John. And the next thing that we're going to start doing is we've got a long time we're going to spend in Acts and all the epistles related to it. So if you're, if you're going to be following along for the next long while, we're going to take portions of Acts and then we're going to we're going to compare it alongside with Ephesians, Galatians, Corinthians, any of the, the epistles that are written to the churches that Acts is talking about. That way we get a really, really nice picture of what is happening in Acts and how that relates to the early church formation, to what churches look like, to who the people were. And I think that's going to be a, a really fun study, particularly as we talk about what it means to grow and this week we're going to talk about growth as well. So, before we begin this uh, Sunday morning, if you would uh, bow your heads and pray with me. Lord God, this morning we come before you with thankful hearts. Thankful that you've given us so much that we maybe sometimes take for granted that you have offered us all that she can, that you've given freely yourself your Son has given all for us, and that has given us both freedom and the opportunity to serve. And we ask, Lord, that we be mindful of that this morning. As we dive into your word, give us wisdom, help us to understand and grow, and to bear fruit in your name. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 So, John 15 is where we're going to be this morning. If you would like to follow along, that's what we'll be reading through. So we've followed Jesus on this rather long journey from his first sign and his first I am statement to his seventh sign. And now here we are at his seventh and final I am statement. Jesus helps us to understand something very deep in John that sometimes we don't see in the other three Gospels. And it gives us this very complete and wonderful picture of who Jesus is and what Jesus taught. This final I am statement is sometimes the hardest for us to understand because uh, our culture has moved so far away from what it means to be vine pressers or gardeners or farmers for that matter. Most of us live in towns and though we appreciate good fruit, we don't always think about what it takes, what it is uh, to raise plants, to, to develop something that isn't going to harvest for a long time, and the kind of effort that takes. So, I'm going to try my best to try and take us through what, what is happening in this verse. If you can recall from two weeks ago, Jesus has just had the Last Supper. Although it doesn't look the same in John as it does in the other Gospels. There's all this talk and all of this fear running through the disciples. Because Jesus starts to tell them very clearly what's about to happen. He knows that this is the last time he's going to sit with them and eat. And he knows exactly what's going to happen. He knows who's going to betray him, who's going to stand beside him in these last moments, and he tells them. And rather than condemn them, he comforts them. Last week, or the week before last, we saw that he takes time, even when he's troubled, 
to tell them that all is going to be well, that in his father's house there are many rooms, and he's going to prepare a place, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And as I said the last time I was with you, it's our job, it's our task, to continue sending materials to our Lord and Savior, because he wants to add more rooms. This mansion needs to get bigger, it needs to grow. And this week we're going to add on to that. Jesus gets up from the table and he leaves, and that's where we start. So I'm not sure what Jesus is doing, but he's walking. He's, he's going from one place to another. So think of that as we read this passage. And I'm going to read uh, verses 1 through 8, if you would like to follow along. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch of me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. Jesus is great at this, right? This, uh, this beautiful metaphor, this fantastic way of expressing himself and using things that the disciples are going to understand. And I sometimes wonder why he's talking about vines, right? Where does this come from? I mean, in John, he doesn't talk about, he doesn't talk about the Last Supper the same way the Gospels, the other Gospels do. He doesn't offer them a cup filled with wine in John. That doesn't happen. He, he may have done so, but John doesn't open that up for us. So why is he talking about vines? What is it that has made him consider this beautiful plant and what it means? And what it looks like. Why does he have this metaphor in mind? And maybe there's a couple options. Perhaps, as is the case even now in Israel, there was a vineyard on his way. I had this really cool experience. In fact, I showed you pictures a couple weeks ago of a tomb. And the odd thing is, is that tomb actually resides in the middle of an old vineyard, in the middle of Jerusalem, more or less. Pretty much right in the middle of the city. It has its own cistern, you know, a place for gathering water that can be brought up to water all the wines. And there's this beautiful garden there. It's called the Garden Tomb. And it's run by Protestants, which is actually a weird thing in Jerusalem. There's not a lot of places you find where Protestants are in charge. There's a lot of Catholics, there's a lot of Orthodox, there's a lot of all sorts of different groups. There's the Jewish Orthodox, there's there's the Muslims as they run the Temple Mount area. But the Garden Tomb is one of those places where there's clearly been a vineyard for hundreds upon hundreds of years. So perhaps as Jesus gets up from the table, he walks out and he's looking around the city and he can see spread upon the hillsides these small plants coming up from the ground, held up by these interesting little lattice works to make sure that the vines don't just root to the ground because they're so covered in fruit. Or perhaps it's something else. This week, I, uh, I took my last final step of becoming the ultimate nerd of the Bible. So I, for years and years, as I have read through books and books and books about the Bible, there's almost always a reference to this guy whose name is Josephus. Now Josephus, 
kind of lived at the same time as Jesus, but he lived a little bit later, perhaps. And we know Josephus, the reason why he's famous is because in the years that John was writing this gospel, Josephus and his friends, the Zealots, started a revolution in Israel. And that revolution ultimately led to the destruction of the temple in AD 70. Perhaps, perhaps 40 years or so after Jesus has died. And Josephus is also famous for writing a history. And that history is called The Antiquities of the Jews. It's the name of the book. It's a very old book. And I downloaded it from a free app online to my phone. So I can now read this old text anytime I want. Which, I, like I said, makes me the absolute dorkiest Bible nerd you can find. Amen. So I'm ordering my own sandals to look like Jesus at all times. <laughs> But in the Antiquities, there's this interesting passage. And it's not something I knew about previously, but did you know that when Herod the Great decided he was going to rebuild the temple, he did this amazing thing, a lot of amazing things. Herod was famous for building. He built all over the place, palaces and gardens in the middle of the desert, you know. You could still walk around Israel today and see these massive stoneworks that are all Herod's handiwork. He was wealthy, he was knowledgeable, he loved to build. And when he decided to rebuild the temple, Herod had this great plan to get everybody on board. Because you can't rebuild the temple without priests. Because nobody can go into certain parts of the temple, right? If you're going to do anything there, you have to train priests how to build. You have to have all the building work set aside. And for 10 years, he gathered all these massive stones. And he set them aside so people could see them. So that when he finally did this building, they'd be on board. And one of the final things about that temple is that out front, on the actual temple building itself, not, not further out where all the gates were, but right there on the front of the temple, they had this amazing piece of artwork. And what it was is gold leaves, vines, with fruit coming off of it. Massive, massive works of gold that could be seen from miles. In fact, Josephus talks about seeing it from far away, and it's, it dazzles the eyes, and the gold looks like white fire. The whole building seems to be just glimmering because of these gold lines that come down the front part of the gate. And everybody knows this. The whole of Jerusalem would have seen this every day. They would look up to the Temple Mount, they would see the gold vineyard, basically, running down the front of the temple. And so perhaps, as Jesus gets up from the table and he takes his disciples out of the city, he has got to look up, and there is the vine. Now the vine is also a very important thing in the Bible. You don't have to go very far to find things about vines, but this one is perhaps the most compelling. And unfortunately, I didn't want to let you know about this, so I will just read this for you. This is from Ezekiel 15. Ezekiel is writing his, his prophecy to the people in exile. The word of the Lord came to me. O mortal, how does the wood of the vine surpass all other wood? The vine branch that is among the trees of the forest, is wood taken from it to make anything? Does one take a peg from it on which to hang any object? It is put in the fire for fuel. When the fire has consumed both ends of it and the middle of it is charred, is it useful for anything? When it was whole, it was used for nothing. How much less when the fire has consumed it and it is charred, can it ever be useful for anything? Therefore, thus says the Lord, like the wood of this vine among the trees of the forest which I have, grown, I have given to the fire for fuel, so I will give up the inhabitants of Jerusalem I will set my face against them. Although they escape from the fire, the fire shall still consume them. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I set my face against them. And I will make the land desolate because they have acted faithlessly, says the Lord God. In the Old Testament, the vine is in reference to Israel. 
the people are taken from Egypt like a, like a vine, and they are transplanted in place in Israel. And so whenever somebody talks about vines, they're talking about Israel. And that's why that beautiful gold vine with all those beautiful gold grapes is draped onto the front of the temple. And in fact, in AD 70, when the temple was destroyed, that gold was taken back to Rome and used all by itself to build a new palace for the emperor. There was that much gold on it. And the people of Israel saw themselves as the vine. But what does Jesus say in our verse this morning? He says, I am the true vine, and my, fa my father, the vine grower. Throughout time, Israel had been pruned, it had been destroyed, it had been consumed, it had been transplanted multiple times. But now it's not Israel that is the vine, right? It's Jesus. Which doesn't mean that Israel can't still be part of God's plan, but what does it mean now? Rather than being the vine all by itself, Israel is now a part of what God is doing through Christ. They want to take part of that. Apparently, Jesus is now the way, as we learned in the last chapter. And here's the other piece that I struggle with. You see, as he moves on to verse 2, he talks about the branches that bear fruit. And the branch that bears fruit is pruned to bear more fruit. So even, even if you are bearing fruit, you're still going to get clipped, right? God's going to get out his shears and he's going to cut off the dead pieces. You can kind of see here on my vine, there's little leaves that are starting to brown. They're starting to die. God would come along, and even if it was bearing fruit, he would take away the parts and the pieces that are no longer valuable. And by pruning, it would grow more and more. It would get better, fuller. More fruit would come. Let's think about that. Who here wants to be pruned? Let's be honest. I never pray for humility because I know what happens. And I think that there's a lot of times I don't ask God to work in my life in some ways because I'm afraid of what pruning looks like. What is God going to get rid of on my branch? What, what goes away in God's pruning? And perhaps that's something we should consider. What in your life is God pruning away so that you can bear more fruit? And the other question, and the scarier question, perhaps, for all Christians, particularly as Protestants, who struggle with this question. Jesus tells his disciples in verse 3 that they've been cleansed by his word, and that all they have to do in verse 4 is abide in him. And this is simple, right? Because the branch already abides in the vine. It doesn't take much. You're already connected. The main vine comes up and the branches come off. And these, these branches, they're not going to bear any fruit if they're over here, right? They have to be on the vine. So all that makes sense as the metaphor goes. Because we can't bear fruit unless we're in Christ. Like I said last week, our job is to send building materials to Jesus as he prepares his father's house. But we can't do that on our own. This is not some project we're doing by ourselves. Like we can all go out today and meet people on the street and bring them in here and make them into Christians, baptize them in there, bring them back out here, and then they'll join Jesus and they'll have their own house and his mansion. None of that gets accomplished without Christ because we are branches on the vine. Whatever happens, happens because Christ is in us. The Holy Spirit dwells within us and what we do, we do in Christ's name because we are branches and he is the vine. So never think that it is your job to do Christ's work. Christ is always doing his work, and you just happen to be on his vine. Yes. Those who abide in me, and I in them, bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. 
here's the scary part in verse 6. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. We just saw this in Ezekiel, right? That fine wood isn't useful for much. And when it isn't bearing fruit, it's tossed out. It's burned, it's charred, it's made useless. Can that be us? It's a really big question. Can we cease to be useful? Can we cease to bear fruit? Can we be chopped off and thrown away? I think that's a fairly important question, but at the same time, I think it's our job to make sure that never happens, right? Yeah. Isn't that why we gather here on a Sunday morning? Because what we really want is to bear more fruit, not be thrown away into the fire. Yeah. And as we're looking to gather others into the vine, perhaps you should just be aware that the possibility is to be pruned off. I don't know how, and I don't know why, because I leave the judgment up to God. But I think we should always be aware that the possibility exists that whole branches can be removed. And here's the interesting part. I think we should start talking about fruit. <clears throat> so, this particular vine is not very much of this. But think of how plentiful this one branch is. This isn't even a branch. This is something coming off of it. I didn't count, but there's probably over 30 grapes just on this alone. I've actually got some grapes back there, which I may have been able to start passing around. And if you're able to get up and pass the next person, feel free to take a piece. And as we're talking about good fruit, I want you to eat at least one piece if you can. Unless, of course, you have to be allergic to grapes or some such. Or you just don't like them, I suppose. So good fruit. What does it mean to bear good fruit? Of course, we know what Paul says about good fruit, right? He lists out what a good fruit might be. But here in John's Gospel, we see some specific things. And this this one in verse 7 where he talks about asking for whatever we want. What does it mean to ask something of God? What do we do when we're asking of God? Does anybody know? Praying. Absolutely. So what is good fruit to Christ? What is one good fruit in John? Praying. 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 You see, we pray to God. And as long as we abide in Him, by which I mean, if we are Christ, whatever we ask for in His name, He will give to us. That is a good fruit. Prayer. What is another good fruit that John starts talking about here? That we bear, we abide in Him. Did they catch the other one? What does Jesus ask of us? Our worship. He asks our worship. He asks us to follow his commands. To be his people. And he goes on to talk more about that. So let's let's delve into that a little bit more. So we got one good fruit at this point, and that is to pray. To be abiding in Christ, our prayers will be answered. Number one, the good fruit is prayer. As we move on, let's read 9 through 17, if you'll read with me. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my life, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in His love. I have said these things to you so that you may, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command you, I do not call you servants any longer, 
Because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends. Because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me. But I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. So that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. And I am giving these commands to you so that you may love one another. Did anybody catch any other fruits in there? So we have prayer. And following these commands. Jesus spoke a lot to his disciples. We have four whole gospels filled with Jesus' teaching. In our Tuesday night Bible study, we're going through those things, and there is much to know about what Christ taught. His commandments are wide and deep and amazing. So, if we love him, we will do what he commands us to do. The second group. Anybody catch any other fruit in there? It's a big one. Love. 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 I have loved you, love one another. I think that one's the one that has the most practical aspect for us, right? Who is who is the one another here? Who is Jesus talking to? He's not talking to his enemies. There's no Pharisees in this moment. There's no Sadducees walking around with him. There's not a single scribe or zealot or any weirdo outside. There's not even somebody being healed in this moment. Who is Jesus talking to? Us. The disciples. To us. Very good. And he commands us to love one another. And I think nothing else will be more fruit, bear more fruit, be more fruitful in the life of the church than to do this one simple thing. Because following Jesus' commands means loving one another. And loving one another gives glory to God. When we love one another, God is glorified. Amen. Period. Fruit number three, love one another. And the attachment then is this. That when we do those things, what happens? God is glorified. Amen, right? Amen. Isn't that what we want? The glory to go to God? Because in our culture, what? who gets glorified? What happens? Where, where is the glory in the United States a lot of times? In the individual. In the individual. I mean, what is it? Most people do on a Sunday in the winter, say. Are they at church always? Football. What, oh, yes, yeah. they're likely to watch football, right? <laughs> and in the summer, it could be baseball, or right now, it could be women's soccer, right? Amen. Amen, yeah. Go yeah. oh, USA. <laughs> but we do that. We, we seek glory and we give glory to many things. Some good, some valuable. Yesterday we celebrated independence. A wondrous thing to give glory to. For it's nice to be able to be here on a Sunday, right? Amen? Thank you. We want to be here. We yes. want to celebrate our, our Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. But at the same time, is independence what the Bible is most about? I would say of all the themes the Bible holds, I'm sure the Exodus would be included in the independence thing. But that's not all the Bible teaches, right? Independence is not our single aim, our only goal. In fact, in this passage, what happens? What? They're no longer called what? The disciples are no longer servants. called servants. servants. So before this moment, that is what they were. And the, the Greek word for servant is doulos, which, which can be slave. <coughs> I mean, it's more like an indentured servant, but it's it's those things. To be a slave to the master is a valuable thing. Because 
we're following his commandments, right? We don't see Jesus following the disciples' commandments. Right? Their love isn't dependent upon him following their commandments, but only in one way. Because who is getting the glory? Jesus. God in heaven. Our Father, our Heavenly Father. And so by our love, by our following his commandments, by our prayers, God has given the glory a truly wondrous fruit. I am the vine, and you are the branches. I found this little guy at work yesterday. Kind of a sad little thing. There was only two of them on the thing, and I actually picked the one that looked the most sickly. <laughs> Which maybe is not the best way to do an illustration, right? To choose the sickly vine. But let us think about this. As branches on the vine of Christ, I think some of us are looking a little withered. And I mean that of everybody. Me, I'm not that great at praying. I try real hard. But as far as that fruit goes, and eh, probably not the most beautiful grape on the vine. A little withered, a little pruny. You know how they get the little brown spots? That's my fruit of prayer, perhaps. We all have different gifts, but when you think about the fruit on the branch that is you, what is lacking? Is it love? Is it following the commands of Christ? Is it giving glory to God? Is it more? Is it perhaps some of the fruit that Paul talks about? Self-control, perhaps? We're not very good at that in this culture either. I'm sure most of us Shot off way too many fireworks, ate way too much food yesterday. <laughs> Took way too long a nap. In my case, I, I had way too much milkshake. <laughs> but just generally speaking, we're probably looking a little withered, right? And that's what this time is about. We come here on a Sunday to be watered, to be nourished, to grow to learn more about the commandments of Jesus, to stand more firmly with Christ in our lives. So what does Jesus ask of us this morning? What does Jesus ask of you as you grow upon the vine? Does he ask for you to follow his commandments closer? To pray in his will? To love one another? This vine can grow. This one and this one. Amen. And that's what Christ asks of us. For the vine is never going away. Christ is eternal. He has given us this wondrous gift to be part of the vine. To be a branch. But that demands <laughs> something of us, right? When most of us are good Protestants, we like to think of the the message of the Bible being about grace. But if the grace of Christ is in you, then it ought to work out because there's something more, right? There's this. There's fruit of the person that lives in the grace of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Do you want to bear fruit? I'm serious. Do you want to bear fruit? Yes. Yes. It's complicated. There's a lot of things Jesus wants from us, but it's also very simple. I mean, I looked really hard at this passage for what good fruit might be, and it's, it really is that simple. Praying. And sometimes that's hard. It is for me. Loving one another. Following the commands of Christ and giving glory to God is the demand of our Lord and Savior. And that should be our focus. Yes, Lord. If bearing good fruit is something you want, I'm hoping this is the place to find it. Because as we love one another, 
you will bear good fruit. <coughs> As we follow the commands of our Lord and Savior, we will bear good fruit. And it's here and it's out there. Yes. So, this morning as we finish up our reading of the Gospel of John, I encourage you, if you want to bear good fruit, if you want to continue to be pruned by the vine grower of the Lord God, if you want to continue to be grafted on to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, continue to seek Him. Yeah. And here at Taste Drink Fellowship, our elders, myself, we're here to help you grow. And if you love us, you'll be here to help us grow. So let's do that. Let us see this branch become healthy again. Or more healthy than it is. It can always be better. Let us strive for that. Let us bear the fruit. Let's do it.